Number three, Richard Spack. Richard Spack was born in December 1941 in Illinois. He was the seventh of eight children, and as a young child, he was close with his father, who was a hard-working and sober man. Speck's father died when he was just six years old. Three years later, Speck's mother remarried, and she moved Speck and his younger sister to Dallas, Texas to live with her new husband. Speck's stepfather was an abusive alcoholic who tormented Speck, his sister, and his mother. Speck was a poor student, and he started drinking at the age of 12. He was first arrested when he was 13 for trespassing. This was the start of Speck's life of crime. He spent the next eight years of his life committing crimes like theft and forgery. He would be arrested, jailed, and then paroled, only to be arrested a short time later. In October 1961, when Speck was 20 years old and out of prison, he met 15-year-old Shirley Annette Malone at the Texas State Fair. They started dating and within weeks, Shirley was pregnant. They got married in January 1962 and Shirley gave birth to a daughter six months later. The marriage was turbulent and Speck was horribly abusive. Luckily for Shirley, he wasn't around much because he was in and out of prison. During one of his prison stays, he got his infamous tattoo, Born to Raise Hell, which was written on his forearm. In January 1965, Speck was on parole and he was prowling the streets with a 17-inch carving knife. He happened across a young woman walking to her car after an evening of bowling. Speck jumped out from behind a bush grabbed her from behind and held the knife to her throat. She screamed and Speck ran away. He was arrested a short distance away and he was convicted of the assault. He was sentenced to 490 days in jail, but because of a clerical error, he was released 300 days early in July 1965. In January 1966, Shirley filed for divorce. Shortly after hearing about the filing, Speck was drinking in his favorite bar, and he got into a fight with another patron. During the fight, Speck pulled out a switchblade and stabbed the man several times. Speck was arrested and he was charged with aggravated assault. His mother hired a lawyer who got the charges dropped down to disturbing the peace. Speck was fined $10, but he didn't pay it, and he spent three days in jail. In March 1966, Speck bought a car, and later that same night, he went to a local A.M.P. grocery store. He broke in and stole about 70 packs of cigarettes. He drove away, and just minutes after stealing the cigarettes, he started selling them out of his car in a parking lot. Someone heard the breaking at the A.M.P. and the police were alerted, and then they learned that someone was selling cigarettes a short distance away from the grocery store. By the time the police got to the parking lot, Speck was gone, but he left his car behind. They traced the car back to him and put out a warrant for his arrest. Speck decided to get out of Dallas and he took the bus to Chicago, Illinois to stay with his older sister. He ultimately ended up in Monmouth, Illinois, which is where he lived before his mother remarried. On April 2nd, 1966, not long after arriving in Monmouth, he broke into the home of a 65-year-old woman while she was out babysitting. He sexually assaulted her and stole her babysitting money, $2.50. A week later, it's believed that Speck committed his first murder. 32-year-old Mary Kay Pierce was a bartender at a bar that Speck liked to frequent. Pierce told her friends that Speck had followed her home at least once. Pierce went missing on April 9th, and her body was found four days later in a hog house that was located behind the bar where she worked. The cause of death was a ruptured liver caused by a powerful blow to the abdomen. At the time, Speck was working at a company that constructed the hog houses, which had sold to farmers. The police interviewed Speck about the murder of Pierce, and he denied being involved. Speck just happened to leave town right after the police interview. He 
He went to Chicago where he stayed with his sister for a short time and then he started living in rundown motels. On July 13, 1966, Speck spent the day drinking in several bars in South Chicago. He started off his day of carnage by sexually assaulting a 53-year-old woman in her apartment. As he was leaving her apartment, he stole her gun. He then went back to the bar and continued to drink. At around 11 o'clock that night, Speck went to the townhouse located at 2319 East 100th Street. The townhouse was a dorm for student nurses. Three of them came from the Philippines to study. Using his knife, Speck pried the screen out of the back window and climbed into the townhouse. He rounded up seven of the women who were in the townhouse. He got them into one bedroom and then he tore up a bed sheet and used the strips to tie up all the women. After they were tied up, he took 20-year-old Pamela Wilkening to another bedroom where he attempted to sexually assault her. Then suddenly, two nurses, 21-year-old Suzanne Ferris and 20-year-old Marianne Jordan, walked into the room and they were surprised to see Speck. They put up a fight and Speck stabbed both of them multiple times. He then turned the knife on Wilkening, who was still tied up. Speck washed his hands and then went to the bedroom where the women were being held. He picked another woman and led her to a different bedroom. He would spend 20 to 30 minutes with the woman and then he would wash up and come grab another victim. He spent four and a half hours following this routine. All eight victims were either stabbed or strangled. Some of them showed signs of sexual assault. After Speck left the townhouse, he went to the hotel where he was staying. He had a beer and then he promptly fell asleep. During his killing spree, Speck missed one young woman, Karazan Amarau, who saved herself by hiding under a bed. After Speck left, she started screaming from the bedroom window. Someone heard her screams, and the police were alerted. They arrived on the scene a short time later, and they found the bodies of Ferris, Jordan, and Wilkening, along with the bodies of 22-year-old Gloria Davy, Patricia Matuzak, 20, Nina Schmall, 24, Merlita Gargulo, 22, and Valentina Passion, 23. The mass murder not only shocked the people of Chicago, but it mortified people anywhere the story made the news. The police interviewed Amarau, and she said that the man had a blank face and a tattoo that read, Born to Raise Hell. An intensive manhunt was launched nearly immediately. About 72 hours after he broke into the townhouse, Speck slit his wrist in a seedy hotel. After doing so, he changed his mind and called for help. He was taken to a hospital, and a the doctor there noticed his tattoo. The police were alerted and Speck was arrested in his hospital room. Speck claimed he didn't remember the massacre because he was so high and drunk at the time. He was ultimately convicted and sentenced to death. When the death penalty was ruled unconstitutional in 1972, Speck's sentence was reduced to 400 to 1200 years in prison. He was later reduced to the maximum of 300 years. In prison, Speck was given the nickname Birdman because he had a pet sparrow. When he heard he couldn't keep the sparrow, he threw it into a fan, killing it. Speck was one of 36 men interviewed by FBI agents Robert Ressler and John Douglas, who are the inspiration for Mindhunters Holden Ford and Bill Tench. Ressler said that he didn't think that Speck had any insights into his crimes. Richard Speck died in prison on December 5, 1991, at the age of 50. Then in 2006, Speck made headlines again. A two-hour videotape surfaced that was recorded in prison before Speck died. In the video, Speck is drinking alcohol and he snorts cocaine using a $100 bill. He also developed breasts because he had been taking female hormones that were smuggled into the prison. In the video, he is asked why he killed the women. His response is, it just wasn't their night. He was also asked how he felt about the murders and he said, like I always felt, 
had no feeling. If you're asking me if I felt sorry, no. Number two, Jerome Brudos. Jerome Brudos was born on the last day of January in 1939 in South Dakota. When he was young, his family moved to Portland, Oregon. Brudos didn't have a happy family life. His mother adored his older brother Larry, and she cruelly belittled Brudos. When he was born, she wanted a daughter instead of a son, and she constantly told him this. When he was five years old, Brudos found a pair of open-toe, high heel shoes in the junkyard, and he became fascinated by them. He took them home and wore them. His mother caught him wearing the shoes, and she berated him. She demanded that he throw them out, but he didn't. He kept them hidden, and he would wear them when he was alone. After catching him a few more times with the shoes, his mother burned them in front of him. This was the start of a foot fetish that Brutus would carry with him for the rest of his life. As a teenager, he would steal undergarments and shoes from neighbors' homes. His first known serious criminal act happened in 1955 when he was 16. He told a neighbor, an 18-year-old woman whose undergarments he had stolen, that he could help her get them back she just had to come to his house. The girl did so, and inside the house she found Brudos wearing a ski mask and holding a knife. He forced her to undress and then he took several photographs. He then left the house and the girl hastily dressed. As she was leaving, Brudos, who wasn't wearing the mask, came into the room and tried to convince her that the masked man wasn't him. She didn't report the incident to the police. When Brutos was 17 years old, he lured a 17-year-old girl into his car and then he drove her to an abandoned farmhouse. He ordered her to strip and when she didn't, he attacked her. A couple who happened to be driving by stopped the attack and the police were called. Brutos was arrested and his house was searched. They found the photographs that Brutos had taken of his neighbor while he was wearing the mask. He was committed to a psychiatric hospital, and he was diagnosed as a borderline schizophrenic. Despite this, he was allowed to leave the hospital during the day to attend school. He graduated from high school and he enlisted in the army. However, he was soon discharged because of his history of mental illness. After he was discharged, he moved back to Oregon to live with his mother, who forced him to live in a shed in the backyard. Around this time, he started attacking young women and choking them into unconsciousness. Once they were out, he would steal their shoes. Two years later, when Brutos was 22, he met the woman who would become his wife, 17-year-old Darcy Metzler. They got married just months after they started dating. Brutos forced her to do housework naked, and he would photograph her in the nude. He also wore women's clothes and took pictures of himself. He developed the pictures in a dark room that he built himself in the basement of his house. In 1967, Brutos was 28 and he was now the father of two and he and his family were living in Portland. He finally managed to get a steady job as an electrician. That year, his crimes started to escalate. Shortly after the birth of his second child, Brutos followed a woman home and broke into her house to steal her shoes. She woke up and found Brutos in her home. He choked her and sexually assaulted her, but ultimately he left her alive. On January 26, 1968, 19-year-old Linda Slauson was selling encyclopedias door-to-door -door in Portland. When she got to Brutos' house, he led her to his garage. Once there, Brutos bashed her in the head with a 2x4 and then strangled her to death. He then went in the house, gave his wife some money, and told her to take the kids out for some food. After they left, he went back to the garage and dressed Slauson's dead body in various undergarments and high heels that he had stolen over the years and he took pictures of her. When he was done with his photography session, he cut off one of her feet with a hacksaw. He then placed the foot in one of his stolen shoes and stored it in the freezer. 
That night, once his family was to sleep, he loaded the rest of her body into his car and drove to the Wilmette River. He tied Slauson's body to a car transmission and then he dumped her body over a bridge. He then moved his family from Portland to nearby Salem, Oregon. This house had a detached garage and no one else in the family was allowed to go into it. On November 26, 1968, Rudos was driving home from work when he came across 26-year-old Jan Whitney, whose car had broken down. He told her he could fix her car, but he needed to get a tool from his garage. Whitney got into Rudos' car, and then he drove to his house. He went into the garage, came back out, and got in the back seat behind Whitney. He then put a leather strap around her neck. He closed the car door on the strap, and it continued to strangle Whitney. Brutos then got into the front seat and violated her while she died. After she was dead, Brutos moved her body into his garage and hung it on a hook. Over the next five days, he would visit the body and he played out his sick fantasies. Six days after the murder, Brutos and his family left for vacation. He left Whitney's body on the hook in his garage while he was gone. When he returned after several days, he dumped her body in the same part of the river that he dumped his first victim. On the afternoon of March 27, 1969, 19-year-old Karen Sprinkler went missing. Her car was found on the roof of a parking garage in downtown Salem the day after she went missing. The police interviewed people who were in the parking garage the day that Sprinkler went missing and some of them saw a large man dressed in drag in the parking garage. Just a month later, Brutos tried to kidnap two young women on two consecutive nights, but they both escaped. On the third night, Brutos encountered Linda Donsaley, and she wasn't as lucky. Brutos posed as a police officer, and he kidnapped her. He then asphyxiated her to death. A month later, a fisherman happened across her body in the Long Tom River. Her body had been weighted down by a car transmission. The police searched the river and they found Karen Sprinkler's body nearby. It had been weighted down with a car engine. Around the same time that the two bodies were found, Rudos developed a new ploy for finding victims. He would cold call women in their dorms and tried to convince them to meet him for a blind date. After the bodies were pulled from the river, the police started to realize that one person was killing young attractive women and he may be using places like the local university to look for victims. They made this information public and a university student got in contact with them. She said she went on a blind date with Brutos after he called her dorm and he had creeped her out. After she contacted the police, Brutos called her again to see if she wanted to go on a second date. She agreed and told him to come to the dorm, and then she called the police. The police met Brutos at the dormitory and questioned him. He denied being involved in the murders, and he answered all their questions, so he wasn't arrested. The next day, the police went to his house to ask him some follow-up questions. When they went there, they noticed now things around the property to raise even more suspicions. The police asked one of the women who escaped if Brutos was the same man who attempted to kidnap her. She said yes, so the police got a warrant to arrest him for attempted kidnapping. When the police went to arrest him, he fled. After a short chase, the police took him into custody. He was eventually charged and convicted of the murders of Jan Whitney, Linda Saley, and Karen Sprinkler. He was in charge with Linda Slauson's murder because her body was never found. While he was in prison, he met with Wrestler and Douglas. Rudos confessed to the murders in graphic detail after he was arrested, but he later claimed he was innocent. He claimed this despite overwhelming evidence that he committed the crimes. The police found his collection of photographs of his victims, along with some of their body parts. He kept some of their possessions, like jewelry, and in some cases he gave the jewelry to his wife to wear. 
Jerome Rudis died in prison in March 2006 at the age of 67. His confirmed victim count is four women, but 12 other women went missing in the area where he lived while he was active, and their cases remain unsolved. Number 1. Edmund Kemper Born in December 1948, Edmund Kemper III was the middle child of Edmund Kemper II and Clarnell Kemper. He had an older and younger sister. When Kemper was nine, his parents, who had a tumultuous relationship, separated. Not long afterwards, his mother forced Kemper to sleep alone in the basement. She said that he needed to sleep down there because she was afraid that he might hurt one of his sisters. As a child, Kemper started engaging in disturbing acts that are common in serial killers. This included killing and mutilating animals. His parents' divorce was finalized when he was 13 years old. Kemper ran away to live with his father, but he was sent back to his mother's not long afterwards. Kemper's mother then decided to send him to live with his father's parents in North Fork, California. Kemper had above average intelligence, but he was just an average student. His grandmother, Maud Kemper, noticed that something was wrong with him and she kept their handgun hidden. However, his grandfather, who was also named Edmund Kemper, gave him a rifle to hunt squirrels and raccoons with. Kemper lived with his grandparents for a year and a half. After returning from a visit with his mother, Kemper's mood took a turn for the worse. On August 27, 1964, Kemper, who was 15, shot his grandmother three times in the back of the head with the rifle that his grandfather had given him while his grandfather was out of the house. When his grandfather returned home, Kemper shot him in the back of the head as well. After his grandparents were dead, Kemper called his mother and asked her what to do. She said to call the sheriff's office and turn himself in. Kemper did what his mother told him and called the sheriff's department. When he was asked why he killed his grandparents, he said that with his grandmother, he just wanted to know what it felt like to kill someone. As for why he shot his grandfather, it was because he thought that his grandfather would have a heart attack once he saw his dead wife's body, so he decided to spare him that. Kemper was eventually committed to a psychiatric hospital. While he was committed, he underwent a variety of tests. The doctors soon learned that Kemper was highly intelligent and he was a sociopath. Kemper soon started helping the doctors administer the tests and by the age of 19, he had become head of psychological testing. He worked directly under the facility's chief psychologist. During his time in the hospital, Kemper learned about psychology and he knew what doctors were looking for when they were trying to determine if he was sane or not. So he would just tell them what they wanted to hear or filled out the test to give them the answers that they wanted. Also, by helping the doctors out by administering tests, it went against the behavior of most sociopaths because sociopaths tend to be uncooperative. So when Kemper turned 21, the doctors agreed to release him. However, the doctors strongly recommended that he not be sent to live with his mother. The Youth Authority, which is known today as the California Division of Juvenile Justice, didn't heed the advice and released Kemper directly into the custody of his mother. At the time, his mother, Clarnell, whose last name was now Strandberg, was living in Santa Cruz, California. She left her third husband, and she was working as an administrative assistant at the University of California, Santa Cruz. Not long after moving in, Strandberg started to berate and humiliate Kemper. To get away from his mother, Kemper would hang out at a bar called the Jury Room, which was a bar where the local police hung out. Kemper wanted to be a police officer, but he was denied because of his size. Kemper was 6 foot 9 and he weighed 300 pounds. Instead, he got a job with the California Highway Department as a flagman. With the new job, he moved out of his mother's house and into an apartment with a roommate. 
He also bought a motorcycle. Even though they weren't living together, Strandberg would call him and nag him. Not long after getting his motorcycle, he was in two accidents. In one of them, he broke a wrist. He received a $15,000 settlement for the accident and he was given time off work to heal. Kemper used the money to buy a car that looked a lot like an unmarked police car and started to pick up young women who were hitchhiking. During this time, he learned how to act around women so that they would be more relaxed around him. He also set up the car so that when he indulged in his dark fantasies, his victims wouldn't be able to escape. Over the course of a year, Kemper picked up and released over 150 hitchhikers. Then, on May 7, 1972, Kemper decided to act on his dark fantasies. He picked up Mary Ann Pesci and Anita Lucessa, who were both 18-year-old students at Fresno University. He drove them to a remote dirt road. He handcuffed Pesci to the back seat and put Lucessa in the trunk. He tried to suffocate Pesci with a bag while strangling her, but found it too difficult. He ended up stabbing her and slitting her throat. He then pulled Lucessa out of the trunk and stabbed her to death. Kemper took their bodies home and put them into his room. His roommate was out for the night. He violated their bodies and dissected them. He buried their remains, except for their heads, which he kept for a while. When he was done with them, he threw them in a ravine. Only Pesci's head was found. After the murders, Kemper went back to giving young women rides and letting them live. He even warned them to watch out because a man was killing young female hitchhikers. On September 14th, he came across 15-year-old Aiko Ku, who was hitchhiking to dance class. Kemper took her to an isolated area, and Aiko instantly knew something was wrong. She managed to lock Kemper out of the car, and she knew that there was a gun in the glove compartment. Yet, she was too afraid to do anything, and she let Kemper back into the car. He strangled her with her scarf, and then put her body in the trunk. After killing her, he went to a bar and had a few beers, and then he took her body home. Once there, he violated and dissected the body. The next day, he had to meet with a psychiatrist as a condition of his parole. The psychiatrist deemed that nothing was wrong with Kemper, and he saw no reason to put him back in the hospital. During the meeting, Kemper had Iko's head in the trunk of his car. He ended up scattering her body parts in different locations, and most of her remains have never been found. Kemper then took a break from killing, and he moved back in with his mother. Four months after killing Iko, in January 1973, Kemper picked up 18-year-old Cindy Shaw. He put her in the trunk of his car and shot her once in the head. He took her body to his mother's house and put it in his bedroom. He dismembered her body and threw most of it in the ocean the next day. He didn't toss her head. Instead, he buried it in his mother's backyard. About a month later, on February 5, 1973, Kemper got into a fight with his mother and stormed out of the house. He went to the university where his mother worked and picked up Rosalind Thorpe and Alice Liu, who were both 18. He shot and dismembered both of them and then dumped their bodies. Some of their remains were found a month later. On the night of April 20th, 1973, Kemper's mother came home and she was apparently tipsy. Kemper went into her room, and she said, You probably want to talk. He said he didn't, and he went to his bedroom. He stayed up all night, and then at 5 o'clock that morning, he went into his mother's room. While she slept, he struck her once with a claw-tooth hammer, killing her. He decapitated her and put her head on a mantle. He yelled and threw darts at it. Kemper realized that he'd be the most likely suspect in the murder of his mother. He thought if there was a second victim, it would make him look less suspicious. 
so he called his mother's friend, 59-year-old Sarah Hallett, and told her to come over for a surprise dinner for his mother. When she got there, Kemper strangled her with his hands and then with Iko's scarf. Sometime later, he tried to be intimate with the body. The day after Kemper killed his mother and her friend, he got into Hallett's car and started driving east. He became paranoid that driving the dead woman's car would attract the attention of the police. So he ditched it, rented a car, and continued driving. Three days later, he was about 1,400 miles away in Pablo, Colorado. That's when he decided to call the police in Santa Cruz and turn himself in. At first, they didn't believe him and thought it was a prank. He called back again, and finally, some police went to his mother's house. They quickly realized that he wasn't kidding. Kemper was arrested and taken back to Santa Cruz. He confessed to the eight murders, and he was sentenced to life in prison in November 1973. While in prison, he was interviewed by Ressler and Douglas. One story about Kemper meeting with the FBI, which is unclear if it is true or not, supposedly happened on Ressler's third visit. He was alone, locked in a small room with Kemper. At the end of the interview, he pressed the button that summoned the guard. No one came, so he kept talking to Kemper and kept pressing the button. But the guard still didn't come, and Ressler started to get anxious about being locked in a cell with a 6 foot 9, 300 pound killer. Kemper picked up on his uneasiness and apparently said, If I went a in here, you'd be in a lot of trouble, wouldn't you? I could screw your head off and place it on the table to greet the guard. Luckily, a guard came a short time later. Kemper said that he was only joking, but Ressler was never in a room alone with him again. At the time of this video, Edmund Kemper, who is also known as the co-ed killer and the co-ed butcher, is 68 years old and he is incarcerated in the California Medical Facility. He is responsible for 10 murders. Thanks a lot for watching the video. Hopefully you found it interesting. If you did, please subscribe. We post a new video every Thursday and Sunday. You can also like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. The links are in the description below the video. But that's all for now. Thanks again for watching.